Hello, my quilting friends. My name is Leah Day, and welcome to episode 96 of the podcast. And this week, I'm going to talk about beating the winter blues in creative ways. Um, this is something that I struggled with this past week because we had about six or seven straight days of dark, gray, rainy weather. And last week, I kind of hit a wall with it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not typically a teary person. You know, I'm kind of a get up and go and keep on moving and grooving kind of person. And when I'm getting sad and teary and, you know, like the idea of coming down here into the basement where we have really low ceilings is just making me want to cry, <laughs> then usually that's a sign something else is going on. I usually like to get to work. And um, yeah, so I, I slowed down. I had to, some time to think about this and work through it. Um, and really, I wanted to share it just because not everyone is happy all the time. And it's okay to be sad, but to also recognize that it's the ebb and flow of life. You're not going to be sad forever. And how to work through it in a positive way, in a creative way, um, that keeps you move, moving forward in a positive direction. I think the thing that when I look back at different times of my life and, and certainly different quilts that I've been working on, the word stuck is the most detrimental. When I feel stuck, when things, you know, stay the same for too long, um, that's when I know something needs to get changed up, something needs to happen. So I hope that you're looking forward to this podcast as I chat a bit about that later on. Uh, of course, I always share a little introduction about what's going on around the house. And uh, if you want to just go ahead and fast forward, I'll include a timestamp below the video so you can jump ahead if that's what you like to do. So I am still working on my pregnant goddess quilt, Eye of Calm. Here she is, looking great. I've done a lot of hand applique on this already. Uh, pretty much her belly, her big belly, her arm is all secure. And you can see I've done that switch out of color where I have switched out the hair, lock of hair that was blue and I've switched that out to a dark purple batik, which is almost, it's reading almost as the same color as the purple silk that I have in there. This quilt is uh, now a mixture of batik and dupioni silk. And just in case you are not listening, sorry, you, just in case you're not watching the podcast, you're listening to it, please also know that we have video in addition to audio. So you can see me working on this as I'm attaching the last uh, few areas. I'm, I'm attaching a few more bands to go around it. The design is right here. I have a master pattern and I have all these rows of like, it's kind of like a long skinny curve kind of creating an eyeball shape around the goddess figure. And I decided not to do all of the rows of them. I'm just going to do basically one row of dark blue around her and then put her on my background. And that's another piece of dark purple batik. So this quilt's gonna end up being three colors, a, a blue teal, a dark blue, and then a very dark purple. And the teal is very light, so that's my light color. The blue kind of rests in the middle in the, as a medium, and then the purple is my dark. So I think it's gonna turn out pretty good. It's gonna end up looking very dark, and that means that's a good thing because that means I can quilt it with white thread, which is my favorite thing to do in the world, and contrast really nicely, and the quilting designs that I pick are really going to show up. So I'm excited about that. I'm already starting to think about how to quilt it. I will be honest, um, just in the design process, I wanted the bands around the goddess to be bigger. So kind of whenever I'm, I'm designing, I know I'm always designing big. I'm always designing huge. I don't always have time to quilt something that big and certainly not quilting it super densely. So I, when I actually got her, I uh, resized the pattern in Adobe Illustrator to actually print her out and make her, I was limiting myself by the length of the silk that I had, which was 40, 44 inches wide. So that was my limitation. So I made her only around 40 inches long and you know, while I love her, she's really, really cute. She's not as big as I'd like. So I'm thinking about also making a fabric panel out of this quilt that'll be much bigger. I can go 36 wide and then however many yards it is long. That'll be kind of fun. 
And I have been getting a lot of questions about selling the pattern. Is the pattern for sale? Um, I do want to make it for sale, but I, I'd like to know your reaction to this. I don't want to write the instructions because I'm still making it. I still don't know what are the, you know, the ins and outs of this pattern. My idea is to sell it as a master pattern. A master pattern is basically the line drawing that I used as a base template. And I could sell different sizes where you, you know, get two or three sizes of the quilt. You could make a big one, a throw quilt. You could make a small one. You could make a tiny one. Um, so that's just an idea I'm throwing out there. You could make as many of them as you want to. You could simplify the design, but it would be just the master pattern, no instructions. You've got to take it and figure out the rest yourself. So let me know what you think about that. I have been thinking about uh, doing a class, just a class on working with master patterns because a master pattern is an excellent way to work. And, and in my opinion, it is, it is the best way to design a quilt. You can, if you can draw it, you can make it. And there's so many different ways you can work off of master pattern. Uh, in this case, I took her flipped her and use that as the base for templates for uh, turned edged freezer paper applique. I could also use this as a template for uh, a whole cloth, a just a, you know, all those being the lines of a whole cloth quilt and just quilt it onto fabric. I could then paint that whole cloth. So a painted whole cloth is another idea. I could do no sewing until you quilt it, one of my favorite applique techniques, which uses French fuse as a base. And it's also a turned edge applique technique. So that's an idea too. So a master pattern is the design. The technique that you use to put it together is the, you know, is the extra bit. And of course the quilt changes depending on what style, you know, what construction method you use to create it. So I'm thinking about this a lot. Uh, of course it would be easier for me and I would feel comfortable selling it that way this early on most of my other patterns, I don't sell them until I've not only made it once, I've made it probably two or three times uh, and worked out all the kinks in the design and figured out what goes on the top, what goes on the bottom, what, what is the numbering of the pattern, you know, meaning, um, you know, what, what would be if you were starting from the bottom and building a pattern up, you know, in applique style, that's how you typically construct the quilt, what would be number one? And this is something that kind of it, it's a skill to look at the quilt and be able to say, oh, that's background, everything else is on top of it, that's number one, and to go from there. Uh, and it's not that advanced of a technique, but it's not taught a lot. It's not something that, um, it's not a beginner level thing, certainly, and uh, it requires just a little bit more planning and fiddling and testing and trying and you know experimenting certainly and it's a lot in my opinion it's a lot more intuitive working with a master pattern uh, you just kind of have to wing it and you know do your best and then sometimes you have to go back to the drawing board and plan something else out but I think it's a great skill to learn so it's on my list to do a master class <laughs> on master patterns <laughs> I think that that would be a cool class to teach. It would be something very different than I have never taught before. That would be a lot of fun. Um, but I think in the meantime, before I have a chance to create that class, just selling some master patterns and saying, you know, this is what this is. It's basic, but it's also a lower price than it would be if I took all the time to test and tweak and play and fiddle and plan it all out for you and number it for you and you know figure out what goes on top of what and all that kind of good stuff and then write the instructions for a specific applique technique that is one of the limitations I feel like for this other goddess that I have this is the one that we did a quilt tunneling with last year and it was great we had a great time uh, and I really loved being able to share it it's called eternal love and you can find the pattern at leahday.com slash eternal love and that's a great one too, but I wrote it because it was going to be a quilt along. I knew I needed to be specific. So I wrote it for fusible applique and it's specifically written and I didn't include a master pattern. I included broken apart pattern pieces, which took oh, two or three months. I mean, I don't get a chance to work on it every day, but I would say it took two or three months to refine the design make it right, you know, draw it in Illustrator, create all the hash marks, break it all apart, make sure that everything was right, test it, test it, test it. I mean, it, 
you know, a lot of stuff, guys, just gets left on the chopping board because I'm like, I don't know, just don't have time to mess with it. And I hate that. I hate saying that. I hate saying that I, you know, am not going to release something because I don't have time to do all of the, the background work, but that's the honest truth. And, you know, it's kind of a, you know, what, it, it's always a negotiation of what is the best idea at any given time. I'm doing my best and I am working to prioritize the things that are the most important to me and creating this goddess quilt, sharing it with you, letting you have the ability to make one too. That's really, really important to me. So I'm thinking about this and I'd love your feedback. I really, really would. Um, if a master pattern sounds too intimidating to you, then let me know what you think would work as far as the, you know, just the minimum that would make you comfortable taking on something like a goddess, even if it's a panel. Um, I'm working Think, working on working with a new company <laughs> for fabric panels uh, and I'm really looking forward to seeing what we can do together and um, you know trying out something new I love spoon flower I still love to use spoon flower I think it's a great uh, a great way to design fabric I love print on demand because if I designed let's say I took this today and I said I want to make a spoon flower panel today well I could design it upload it and I could order it right then right then and there uh, I don't have months and months of back and forth and, you know, waiting for sampling and all that kind of stuff. If I was designing this for traditional fabric, like let's say I uh, decided to go to a big manufacturer like Bernatex and say, hey, here's this, this cool fabric panel, you know, uh, and they took it. It would be 18 months, if not two years, two years before I ever saw that, before it saw the light of day. <laughs> before I ever got a sample of it. So it, print on demand, you know, it, it might be a little pricey. It's like $17, $18 a yard. Um, the upside is how fast it is. And it's, you know, Spoon Flowers in North Carolina too. So I love giving them my business because uh, another North Carolina fabric manufacturer, which we, North Carolina was a, a big fabric textile. Uh, it was big in fabric textiles. Shelby, North Carolina, where I live now, was big in yarn manufacturing. And of course we lost all those mills. And bringing that back, you know, even in a digital format, I think is awesome. And the digital printing has come a long way, even just since the, you know, 10 years I've been in business and, and working with Spoon Flower on and off. Um, it's, it's really excellent. It's come a long way as far as how the inks work and how color safe they are. Still get a little bit of fading um, here and there, but once I realized, you know, to wash cold water wash and then hang things to dry, even quilts, you know, just hang it, hang it outside uh, to dry, I really noticed a difference. It didn't fade nearly as much. And then I made some napkins, just, you know, kind of running a test too. I made some napkins a couple years ago and we have been using those things for yeah years now and washing them at least once a week and the colors are still looking great so that to me you know especially when i i'm not i'm not washing it cold water wash <laughs> i'm not even it's just throw the napkins in there and get them clean you know it's just kind of whatever whatever the wash ends up whatever cycle it ends up on um and they're still looking great so that was a good test. I'm glad I did that. And it made me feel a lot more confident in using spoon flour as well. So I want to do more of that, definitely. And that's a big reason why I like print on demand is just speed. You know, I like being able to upload something and getting it right then, you know, within a week or so. Uh, and uh, because I sell through spoon flour and you could sell through spoon flour, anybody can design fabric and upload to spoon flour. There's no gatekeepers. And that's another thing that I love about it. Uh, there are so many things in this world where you've got to um, be a professional or have an established business or any of that kind of stuff going on. Well, there's so many things now that you don't. You don't have to have a, you know, um, years and years in business. If you want to design fabric with pink paisleys on it, well, you can go do it. <laughs> <laughs> and make that specialty fabric that you want. And that's really where Spoon Flower came from is a wife wanted to be able to print uh, custom drapes uh, for her house and said, why can't, why, why, why isn't this a thing? You know, why, why isn't there a place online where I can, you know, design this and upload a design and be able to print as many yards of fabric as I want? And she complained about it to her husband and 
uh, he went, well, yeah, maybe we should make that happen. And so that's, that was the origin of Spoonflower. That's how they came about. So I'm looking forward to doing more of that. And, you know, maybe even a panel. If you would like just a panel of this Eye of Calm goddess uh, or any of my goddess quilts, let me know. I have been playing around with watercolors and that is painting a watercolor on paper and then scanning that into my computer, playing around with it and turning it into, it's kind of a combination of Photoshop and Illustrator and working the two programs together in order to make a seamless repeat of a watercolor design. Let me think, do I have any? Yeah, yeah, uh, I had this laid out for something else. Um, but yeah, this was the, like an orange watercolor that I created. You can see the repeat, like there's a shape and it's repeated, I think this is like an eight inch repeat uh, for that orange fabric. And I just like, I like subtle texture. I don't like a lot of texture on my fabric. I don't like a big heavy print. I want there to be texture, some lights, some darks, you know, a, a nice pretty overall color, but I really want the quilting to be able to show, which is why I really like designing based on watercolor. So yeah, that's something I definitely want to do more of and I could design um, this Eye of Calm Goddess with watercolor fabrics, you know, kind of um, designing that, setting that all up and then upload it. So if that's something else that you would be interested in, please let me know. I'm kind of, this is kind of a, uh, <laughs> me surveying your, your interest this week. And, you know, I think that's a good thing. It's kind of, uh, the way I look at it is, you know, if you, if you like something and, and you are appreciating it and you'd like to make it too, you know, I love it when you ask for, you guys ask for a pattern. And I've been getting that request a lot for Eye of Calm as I've been making it. And, you know, I, I, I hate to say no, there's no pattern <laughs> available. Although I don't have time to write an official one right this second. Um, but I'm trying to figure out some other alternative that would work for all of us. And that would certainly, you know, help me out too. So yeah, this is coming together really easily. I have had a little bit of learning curve for this Dupioni silk. Uh, like right now I can tell my iron is running a little on the hot side. It likes to go super shiny. Got to be careful about that. If your iron is too hot and you hit a fabric like silk that's sensitive, it'll go shiny. What that is, is that's scorching. And this is, I'm, I'm right now turning edges to the back, so I'm not too worried about it going super shiny. Uh, and it does seem to take more starch and a slightly higher heat uh, to get the Dupioni silk to turn crisply. Once you get it to turn and kind of force it into submission, then it does turn nicely and go okay. And I'm not having too much of a problem with fraying. It's not, it's not going super fray happy on me, but then again, I'm not, I, I'm not cutting this and then, you know, moving it around a lot. I kind of cut it and then it stays on the table and then I turn the edges and then I glue the whole thing together. It's not getting a whole lot of use. You know, I'm not, I'm not really tweaking this around a whole lot either. So yeah, it's just been getting, getting to know this fabric and I love hand appliqueing it. It, you know, it has that little extra Christmas and it's slubby. There's kind of denser pieces inside of it and it's really, really soft. And I just, I really love hand appliqueing this quilt. It's been a lot of fun. And uh, I, I got a lot of comments last week. I, in last week's introduction of the podcast, I was sitting in my favorite spot in the house in front of a sunny window, hand appliqueing and yeah, it was, perfect and uh, I've been watching Andy Griffin still with James in the evening and so uh, we watch one show and I hand applique through that and then I have been kind of like I don't want to get up I don't want to leave the couch I don't want to leave the spot so I started watching all these documentaries <laughs> on Amazon and uh, turning on audiobooks too that I just you know continue to set and stitch so in all actuality, this isn't taking that much time, you know? Well, I mean, time setting stitching certainly, but it's not it's taking days and days and days or weeks and weeks and weeks. Uh, someone commented last week that um, I would be finishing the quilt uh, when I got that big or when I had my baby. 
I'm trying to, Josh and I are still trying to get pregnant right now. And I kind of laughed. It's like, I don't think it's going to take that long. <laughs> I don't think this is going to be a nine, 10 month quilt. Uh, it's actually going by really, really quickly. And I love that. I'm still thinking and considering whether I want to put this on the long arm and long arm quilt it, or I want to stitch it on my home machine. I'm kind of debating that. On the long arm, it will go on and be finished in a matter of days or weeks. On my home machine, it could be drawn out for years, which is what's been, you know, what's what's happened recently. You know, my last big goddess quilt, uh, it was on the machine, on my home machine, kept floating around for like three or four years. So I don't know. I'm, I'm kind of leaning towards the long arm, but I also feel this hesitation, like I, I might mess it up, you know, and, and not do a very good job stitching it. So... I'm still debating that. I have another goddess quilt. Uh, you can hear, you can see a picture of it. This is called Power of Now. This one has been in progress since 2011 or 12. I want to say this was 2012. That's maybe even 2013. Um, and it, it's designed uh, based on the book Power of Now, which is an excellent book by Eckhart Tolle. And it's designed to be, you know, the goddess in the center is a, is a spot of stillness and then she's surrounded by you know crazy chaotic thoughts and life and you know all the things that are distracting and uh and i used just a wide variety of prints and a giant i think it was giant dahlia pretty sure it was a marty mitchell template set to create the dahlia design around her and i love that um but I never quilted it. I never finished it. Uh, the goddess herself needs work. I wanted to add some more applique in her hair to make her face more interesting. It was interesting. It was, it was back when I still thought green was my favorite color and I have since switched to red. So I'm thinking I need to switch up her hair completely. And my temptation was to rip the goddess face off the middle of the quilt and just completely start over. But that also, I don't know, I kind of want to just modify it. So I might pull that quilt out modify it, play around with it. And then this is the first quilt that I want to do as a throw quilt, an actual quilt designed to be curled up with on the couch and use Minky on the back. I mean, it will be my first goddess quilt where I'm intentionally making her not for show, um, just for fun, just for something to curl up with on the couch, make it super soft, make it super simple, don't quilt it densely. And I think just if I get that modification done with the center of her face, be pretty much ready to go. So that would be fun. That'll be like, that could be test one. And then doing Eye of Calm could be, you know, that could be like practice for quilting Eye of Calm. And that really works for me. I, th I, I truly believe in using the lessons of one quilt to help you reach the next level of the next quilt. And I've done that, you know, pretty much since I started quilting. I've learned something. It's like, okay, I'm gonna learn the basics of applique and then I'll be able to apply it to this quilt that's like, you know, so much more challenging and I'm not so sure if I would get into it and be, you know, be able to do it or mess it up. So I think that's a great way of looking at things. I really do. Yay, I got this one done. So I've got two long curving strips of dark blue, beautiful fabric. And that one, yeah. You know, your pieces are only as good as the templates that they're based off of. So when there's a little wobbly blip on your template, well, you're going to get a little wobbly blip in your fabric. you got to be careful about that. But that looks good. I'm really pleased with that. This quilt has been a nice evolution. It really has. I've just kind of let it flow. I had an idea of what it was going to be at the beginning and didn't end up working out that way. And then now uh, it's really coming together. I'm super happy with my fabric colors. I'm super happy with this change I made to her hair. It's just... It feels perfect now. And I don't say that lightly. It feels really perfect now. And that's great. I hate it when it's a fight. You know, I have had many goddess quilts where it's like, ah, it's on. <laughs> we're, we're having an argument now. And you know, when the techniques are fighting me, that's not a lot of fun. This has really flowed and been nice. Although it is, even though it's this small, it is taking up the nearly the entire table and uh dad was finishing up last week and i said mm, 
can you, you know, he was kind of working on something else. I said, can you clear the table completely? He was like, you know, well, why, why do I need to? And I was like, I need to work on that goddess quilt and I need the whole table in order to work on her. And he was like, yeah, yeah, she's, she takes up that much space. She really does. So that is pretty much it for what I'm working on. I'm going to start gluing this down. The big news on the site this week is pantograph designs. And I have started with six pantograph designs that are available at leahday.com slash panto. And all of these are four inch repeating designs. What that means is basically the uh, width of the design going over your quilt, the amount of space you need to quilt these is four inches. You need a little bit more space than that, obviously, to make sure you can index the design and move to the next level. But um, this will work even if you have like a whole machine on a frame, like the Q-Zone frame, that'll still work great. So I've got loopy line. That'll be a great beginner design. It's, um, it's just a simple loopy kind of, you know, swirls. And that one's really forgiving. So if you stitch off the line, it's not going to be a big deal. We've got chevron, which is straight line, sharp angles. That ended up being a little bit more tricky than I expected, but still really pretty. Soft peaks which is a very open, very large scale stippling, very simple stippling, um, really nice repeating pattern. And that's gonna be a really soft, soft quilt. This one's probably my favorite and that is curvy chevron. It's that same chevron design only with gentle, gentle curves. Again, only four inches repeating. That's about on a half inch scale. So the quilt's gonna feel a little bit stiffer. This would be a great choice for a baby quilt where you wanna make sure that that thing's gonna last the test of time, like a million and one washes for one kid, a million and one washes for the next kid, and then the next generation, and then the next generation. That'll work, that would definitely work. Um, Daisy Flow, perfect choice for a baby girl quilt, and Single Wave, nice large scale design as well. This one was just a little bit tricky because you know, it's a circle and I found, I'm still learning guys and I'm still picking up on what, what makes a design easy for a beginner on a pantograph and what makes a design more challenging. And anything circular can be a challenge because as you come in, it's easy to wobble. And if it doesn't look exactly perfect, you know, it kind of gets that, it's not perfect voice in our heads. But um, I, I played with all of these and I really love all of them. So you can come and find them at leahday.com slash panto. And you can also find the pantograph quilting guidebook, which I came out with because I will be honest, this is a lot harder than I expected. Breaking it down and this was dad and I together working and playing with it and fiddling with it and learning how it all worked. There was a lot more to it than I anticipated. And so I decided to create a guidebook really to kind of walk you through it, to explain how my pantograph designs work because I added extra lines just to make them easier to use, easier for you to index it. And that means move to the next line on your quilt and then move the quilt through the frame to get to the next level too. So all of that, I decided I'll write a guidebook and explain the basics. So all of that is included. It ended up coming out at 24 pages long. So yeah, I ended up writing kind of a little mini book for this, uh, but I'm really, really pleased with it. So you can come and find that too at leahday.com slash panto. Um, whenever you buy a pantograph from leahday.com, it will also come with that pantograph quilting guidebook as a digital download. So come and check out all of that. It's really exciting to be sharing this with the world. And I know that this is only the beginning. I do wanna design wider pantographs, more complicated pantographs. Feathers are on my list too. Um, but this is kind of just my first step in the door and trying it out and seeing how it works and learning. And then based on how much I've learned in the last three weeks now, it's like off to the races, gonna go design a new batch and taking all that I've learned you know, as far as what the design needs, um, how to make it more open without making it wider, you know, and, and I am focusing on designs for smaller machines initially. So four inch repeating designs initially, just simply because, you know, that's where we're getting started. You know, a lot of people take a home machine and put it on the Q-Zone frame or um, just, a, you know, the smaller hoop frames that are really popular right now. And if that's where you're getting started, 
and you're just learning the basics, then I really want you to have some pantograph designs that will work for you. And it also works on a bigger machine too. It just takes a little bit more time because the smaller the design, the more you have to index it and advance the quilt through it in order to get the whole thing quilted. But I would say, honestly, these are so quick that I find myself, you know, like the advancing, you know, just simply rolling the quilt through the machine, you know, getting it reset, smoothing everything out, clamping it all back in, that takes more time than the actual quilting part because I'm just, you know, quilting from the back. And just in case you've never heard of pantographs before, you don't know what they are. Basically, this is a 12 foot long piece of paper. I'll kind of unfold this one a little bit. This one's mine. So 12 foot long piece of paper, you uh, unfold it and smooth it out on the back of the long arm, on the tabletop at the back of the long arm, tape it down, and then you use a laser light or a stylus to follow the design from the back of the machine. So you're quilting from the back. You're not quilting from the front of the quilt where you see it, uh, you're quilting from the back. So you need a stylus or a laser light and rear handlebars on your machine, and then a tabletop on the back of the machine and the pantograph design. So you need a lot of stuff to do it, but once you actually get into it, it does make quilting very simple because you're just following the pattern and that takes the, the thinking about the design and guessing the design part of it out of the equation. And it allows you to cover your quilt with one design, very simply, all over style quilting. And it does come together really nicely, really quickly. So I hope that you'll come and check that out and download your pantograph quilting guidebook and learn more about it. Uh, it was a lot of work and I know this is just the beginning. I'm still learning and I wanna share that with you as well. So. Be looking forward to more stuff on pantographs coming soon. And another thing I've been working on, Mally. I am still working on this doll, still tweaking and getting everything figured out. But um, this weekend I was majorly playing with her shirt. You know, I went through seven, eight prototypes because I couldn't decide whether I wanted her shirt to be uh, a faced neckline uh, or this one, which is basically kind of a, a binding neckline. Uh, where you just basically take a um, one inch strip of bias fabric, fold it in half, and then stitch that around the neckline. And I like that look better. I had Josh, I showed Josh three different dolls. So I was like, okay, here's Miss Bunny in a t-shirt. Here's Mally in a t-shirt. Here's Miss Bunny in another t-shirt. Which one do you like better? And he kind of looked at all of them. He was like, I think this one looks the most like a t-shirt. And uh, I played around with so many different options. I mean, I did a whole like back button and you know, whole nine yards and this is not, this is just, it's designed where it can pull over her head. You just have to kind of tweak her hair a little bit, you know, kind of tug it on and it works. You know, you can pull it over her head even with 100% cotton woven fabric. It's not, an, it's not designed for knit. I decided to let that whole thing go. It is designed for 100% cotton, quilters cotton woven fabric. This is done in a batik right here. Uh, yeah, so it turned out good. I need to do a couple more tests just on the length of her sleeves to make sure that's looking good. And I've also been working on her book bag. Uh, yeah, <laughs> this is like <laughs> complete nerd tangent, <laughs> sewing nerd tangent, 100%. Um, I wanted to do her book bag because her book bag in Mally the Maker and the Queen and the Quilt, the book that this doll is based off of, her book bag is almost a character in and of itself. She's stashing stuff in her book bag. Miss Bunny hides in her book bag at one point. Um, she brings blocks into the world that come and, you know, become real characters uh, in, in a bag, a uh, different bag. But yeah, it's just, it's a character in and of itself. She needs that book bag. And so I really wanted to make it, but I'm still in prototype stage with this because it's a tricky thing. It's a, it's a tricky build. We've got straps. Uh, I wanted a zipper so it works and we've got a little back pocket, although I call that a front pocket on the book bag because it's facing the front. But Josh was like, no, that's a back pocket because it's on the back of the book bag. So we had a whole debate on that. So you tell me, is that a front pocket or a back pocket? What would you say? And yeah, so it unzips and makes a cute little bag. And Josh looked at this and was like, it's ready to go. It's done. And I said, no, it needs a little bit more prototyping help. I need to figure out the fabric. I'm right now, I'm just, I quilted fabric. So this is a, this is actually quilted fabric cut up to make the book bag just so it was nice and dense and um, reinforced, you know, kind of thicker material. 
So I need to figure out how I want to do that. I need to figure out the straps a little bit better. I don't really like the material I've been using for that. And yeah, I needed, I needed a little bit of a shape tweak, but I, I got further along than I have been. And that's the most important thing. This is kind of, it's been on my list and been on my list. And finally this week, you know, I told you guys I was a little, little needing a break, little needing a, a chill out time and get out of the basement more than anything else. And spent my time working on that book bag and I had a ball with it. I had so much fun. It's still not there, but it's closer. And I'm optimistic that one or two more prototypes will probably get it. Doll making, it's a challenge and it's a joyful challenge. Like I love it. It's, it's so much fun, but it's, um, it's hard in the sense of getting started, not knowing what exactly what I want is sometimes the hardest part, you know, where I, you know, I'm kind of looking at this now and only after getting it to that point, can I go, Oh, I want that shape to change a little bit. And Oh, I want that neckline to change a little bit. And you kind of have to stitch, keep just stitching prototypes. And the good thing is it doesn't take up that much fabric. The bad thing is it's, it does take up quite a bit of time and I'm still working on my process where I make a prototype. I have the pattern and then I cut out the next set and that's waiting for me the next time I can come in the room and start working on it. And that works really well. Um, and then I'm, I've come up with a good program for writing what number it is, you know, like prototype number one, prototype number two, making sure that's very, very clear because I might put this away and not touch it for another six months. You know, that's how things can go. Sometimes it can just get too busy and I, and I just don't, I can't get back to it. Uh, or just my interest isn't there. And I'm just like, ah, I'm not really in the mood to deal with that right now. Um, so I have to write it down and know exactly what I'm working on and where, what the next step is. Otherwise I might grab the wrong prototype and, or grab the wrong pattern piece and be working kind of backwards. And that's not any fun. So yeah, I'm, I've learned how much, how many notes that I need. And I'm getting a little bit better about keeping those notes tidy and keeping everything in a binder. And then it had gotten a little bit crazy in that room again. So this morning I took the time to completely clean up, even though I was still kind of in the middle of working on that prototype. I just said, okay, it's Monday. It's a new week. You know, I might not be coming back to this. So I'm going to just stop here and clean up and get everything tidy. And I'm so glad that I did that because that's exactly what I needed in that room. Uh, just to not feel too crazy and chaotic and have, you know, 10 different prototypes out all over the place. And it really helped me also get um, solid on what I want to do next. So I wrote myself some notes there and yeah, it'll be that much easier to go back to it that it's clean and tidy and ready to go. So I look forward to getting back to it. I can't, I can't give you guys a date. I have no idea when that thing will be done. Mally and uh, her book bag and her uh, cute working pants with real working pockets and her t-shirt. I don't know. I'm having fun with it. I'm letting it take as much time as I need to take and I'll let you know when it's ready. That's, that's how I leave things. You know, I, I try my best to be speedy about it, but, uh, at the same time, I'm also trying to be respectful of the time it takes to develop something brand new and it takes time. It really is a process and rushing it means that I would be rushing something and giving it to you and then it would be a struggle for you to put it together because the sleeve doesn't fit into the arm very well or something horrible like that and that drives me nuts. I can't stand fitting in a sleeve that doesn't fit. You know, I'll sometimes even take a tape measure to it and if I find the sleeve does not fit that armhole, <laughs> it's a bad day. <laughs> yeah. So that is pretty much it for what I've been working on around the house. And we had four new members this week join Leah's Quilting Friends Club. And that is Patty Chevalier, Drusilla Fox, Kathy Notario, and Jane McGuigan. Thank you guys so much for joining in the fun and supporting this podcast. You can come and check out the Quilt Friends Club at quiltfriends.club. And that helps support this podcast. It helps me continue to make free tutorials every single week. And I share a special video series just for you guys in, as members of the club. 
basically you can post a picture of a quilt that you're struggling to know how to quilt it and I share three different quilting design ideas uh, based on how you want to use the finished quilt, whether you want to use it for a bed quilt, for a wall quilt, for a show quilt, whatever you want to do with it. And I specifically focus my design around your style of quilting and the machine that you're working on as well. So if that sounds like something that you would like to be a part of and you'd like to become my best quilting friend, <laughs> then come and join in the fun at quiltfriends.club. And I sincerely appreciate all of you guys that have joined in. I have so much fun with this and I will be honest, it is, it's kind of ruined all other social media for me. <laughs> I'm finding that I just, I don't really want to post anything anywhere else because I just have so much fun posting to the club. And yeah, I just have so much fun posting there and seeing all the beautiful quilts and making friends and seeing all the real faces and real quilts behind all of these amazing people that have been commenting and uh, interacting with us for years. That feels amazing. And it just makes me want to do even more for you guys. It really, really does. So yeah, come and check it out at quiltfriends.club. And now for our podcast topic about quilting through the blues or just, you know, working through the winter um, in a creative way. And I got to thinking about this a lot this week because as I said, I kind of, I kind of hit a wall and um, I have to recognize that there are certain times that it's great that I work at home and um, I don't have to leave my house to go to work. I can just come down in the basement and get on the computer. And then there's other times when that is a real liability and I need to leave. I need to get out of the house. I, uh, I need to step away and I need to slow down and not work so much. And this was one of those weeks where it was like, yeah, yeah, need to slow down, need to not work so much and need to get out of the basement. Um, when we bought this house, it was one of the major draws to the house was the fact that it had this um, big, slightly unfinished basement. It was kind of slightly finished, slightly unfinished, not in the world's best shape, but not unlivable. It wasn't like a dirt floor or anything like that, but um, I've just continually renovated the whole house since we bought it. And the basement is still kind of the thing that I haven't really fully fixed yet. But the major draw was the basement because uh, it would allow us to expand. And when we moved in, it was just Josh and I, you know, I was pregnant with James, and, but I always knew I wanted a big sewing studio and to do something with quilting, you know, and turn it into a business. And then it's just slowly kind of taken over the entire house. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the problem with the basement is that we have through a good chunk of it where we have the um, heating and air conditioning unit that runs through the, the like the duct work brings the ceilings down. So like that is the ceiling right there, right over my head through this section. It's like six foot two inches. Doesn't bother me or Josh at all. We're, we're not very tall people. Um, someone that's six foot five would have a problem in this basement. They'd be ducking the whole time. But it was a major draw to the house that we had this much space and it wasn't super expensive. And if, you know, this is just a tip. If you are feeling frustrated and wanting to be able to do more with your quilting and to have more space, you know, a sewing studio and have more space, a dedicated space, look, you know, to buy a house in a cheaper area. You know, we were living in Asheville, North Carolina, which is very expensive. And we took a home ownership class even just to figure out how this was gonna work. And they took us on a tour basically the worst houses in Asheville that were well over $100,000, ridiculously expensive for houses that were basically teardowns. And Josh and I looked at each other and said, we're never going to be able to afford anything nice here. And, you know, certainly nothing with enough space to be able to run a business out of it. So that right there was part of the reason why we chose to move. We chose to move to a cheaper area where we could get more house for the money. And that enabled us to expand. Um, so yeah, the, the basement ceilings are very low and there's not a lot of windows and natural light. We, it's a basement that opens out on one side to the, uh, the outside. It's not fully underground, only one half of it is underground, but it still feels 
subterranean. And the low ceilings are a major part of that. It just feels oppressive. And, you know, being down here six, seven hours a day can start to get wearing. And so the first thing I identified when I started feeling blue last week was just, okay, where do I not want to be? And um, I, I could answer that instantaneously. I don't want to be in the basement. I, I don't want to be in the basement. I can't, I can't stand to go down there. I don't want to be in the basement at all. So that helped me really initially just to identify that I needed sunlight. I needed to be, I have more space around me and, uh, and a lot more light, natural light. I, it had just gotten so dark and dreary and gloomy for days and days and days on end. And um, we've had so much rain this year, guys. It's insane. Um, the front of our yard, <laughs> I'm joking when I say we're working on Lake Day out in the front yard because it, it's, a, it's a puddle that was a puddle and then now it is turning into like a little pond uh, out in our front yard. And I'm really glad about um, four or five years ago, I put in French drains across the front of the house to drain the water off instead of it coming down into the basement. I'm really glad I made that investment because we would be having water in the basement if not for that. Um, so yeah, the the, the rain has just been relentless. And that's, that was a large part of this. And it was just so gray and nasty outside. And I think that I need, and this is the reason why I'm, I'm pursuing getting into um, rabbits. I, I'm, I'm looking at buying some rabbits. In fact, I actually started working on building a rabbit hutch instead of building a shed. I uh, decided to modify my plans and turn it into a rabbit hutch. I need something that will push me to go outside even when it's nasty outside. I need some, I need animals to take care of, like Josh takes care of his chickens. I need something like that that pushes me to go outside even when it's nasty, even when it's wet and rainy and gross, so that I get outside and get vitamin D and see sunlight even if I'm getting rain all over my face too, um, and just not worry about it. And there might be, there can be days sometimes where I don't go outside and that's not good, you know? That's really not healthy. So um, working on that, uh, another thing that I identified, you know, I was kind of, I was feeling really blue, like kind of, you know, I kind of just feel like I could burst into tears at any time, like no problem. I could just burst into tears right now. If someone said the wrong thing, <laughs> I'm laughing now, I'm laughing now, but guys, it's not funny. It, it really isn't funny. This is a serious thing. And if you feel that way for a prolonged period of time, you know, please recognize that and, and do take it seriously and do go get help. Um, and I'm, I'm saying, you know, just, just having someone to talk to can sometimes be so helpful for me that, you know, that was Josh. And I was like, what is going on with me? You know, I'm not usually like this, you know, what's, what's the deal? And he was like, yeah, sunlight, rain, and you've been working too hard. He was like, all of that, all of that. And that really helped me check in and slow down. Um, so, it was James's birthday weekend. We had some friends over and that in and of itself, um, you know, we just don't, we don't have a lot of friends over in general. Um, so that kind of pushed me out of my normal comfort zone and forced me to stop working so much. So I intentionally took several days and slowed down and uh, just focused on, you know, baking cupcakes and wrapping presents and um, making sure the guys were having fun and, uh, you know, that's when I was really puttering around with my Mally doll because I could sit down, stitch a shirt, you know, and kind of have my ear open for, <laughs> they were having a Nerf war down in the basement. So, <laughs> uh, I could be listening for, you know, screaming, yelling, you know, the sounds of like blood. <laughs> no one got hurt. No one got hurt, but, uh, it definitely has been funny coming back down here. This is my working space and coming back down here and finding Nerf darts everywhere. I keep finding them in the weirdest places because they get everywhere. You know, you're shooting somebody with a Nerf gun and you don't know where those bullets are going to end up. So, uh, I keep finding them in random places. And then the, apparently they were throwing pin mores at each other at some point because I found pin mores all over the floor. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, that was, that was a lot of fun. And that was really helpful. I think having that new energy in the house helped me pull myself out of that funk and that was really good. And then working on something so different, you know, Mally, you know, working on the shirt is what I really majorly got. I feel like that's kind of solid. It's kind of finished now. Working on that where I could pick it up, put it down, you know, really 
focus on that, but not, it wasn't such a big project that I felt overwhelmed by it. I didn't feel like I was being interrupted if the guys needed something. And uh, it was also not pressure. There was no pressure behind it. There was no stress behind it. I don't feel a deadline. And let's be honest, it doesn't require a huge amount of brain space because it's just test, you know, cut, stitch, check it out, take a look at it, make up my mind whether I like it or not. It's, it's more of an opinion kind of thing at this stage versus a, is it fitting, is it working kind of stage. You know, and when I'm, when I'm pattern testing and stuff on like, let's say a patchwork design where I'm doing complicated quilt math and if it's wrong, you know, this is horrible, that's really stressful. And I was talking about that last week with the friendship quilt pattern blocks, I, I was really pushing myself very hard to get everything written in a two week time frame and get it all done, get it all done. I was pushing too hard and making it a lot of not fun, you know, and, and it really should be fun. Uh, and uh, when it's not fun, especially, it's easy to make mistakes. And when it's mm, fo so focused on speed, you know, uh, it's really, really easy to make mistakes. So the idea of just slowing down and I took a several day break off of working on those patterns and that was really good. That's what I needed. You know, uh, I really needed that break. And then uh, after a day or two, when I thought about coming down in the basement, I didn't want to cry. <laughs> so that felt better. And it, and it was, it was a major reminder of just like, you know, there's, there's loving your work, which I do. I absolutely love what I do. I wouldn't want to be doing anything else. Uh, but everything can in excess can be too much. And particularly when it's rainy and wet and dark and the low ceilings are getting to me, I've got to give myself permission to take a break and take it easy. And, and, um, to be gentle, to be gentle with myself more than anything else. Now, one thing I did not do when I was feeling bad, I did not go shopping. And that might have been, you know, something I would have done before, but I've been being very, very careful about that. Um, just that urge to get out of the house and kind of um, feel better by buying. And I think that's a, it's an easy habit to get into. Certainly, it's a habit I slipped into. Uh, in the past two or three years, and I'm really wanting to break that habit. Um, you know, like I said, low ceilings, it's a dark basement. Uh, I have found that just getting out in the crafty cottage can be really helpful because it's got a much higher ceiling where I sit at my, my machine, and I can crank up the heaters and get it nice and warm out there, and it's cozy, and I can open the window and um, get some sunlight in there, and it's super, super bright white too. So all of that is good, uh, um, but the temptation to go someplace like the mall, you know, uh, like I would drive into Charlotte and go to the South Park Mall, I, I do think that that's nice as well. And, you know, some malls are nicer than others and, and prettier than others. Um, I think that just the thing that I'm, I'm really trying to be conscious of is just the spending to feel better. I just don't think that that's a good thing. Uh, it's an easy habit to slip into, and it doesn't, it doesn't lead to good things. <laughs> it leads to a lot more stuff being in the house, and the stuff can also be oppressive and cause problems too. So I, um, I think part of the reason why this got a little bit challenging is because what I normally would have done would have been, you know, left, gone somewhere, found something to buy and, you know, and kind of felt better that way. And I am not giving myself that outlet. Uh, and I think, you know, some of this is just simply self-awareness. This is just my own personal journey of, you know, working to, to look at my habits and, and, you know, where, where I want, where I am and who I want to be and how I want to move forward with everything. And yeah, not, Going places and impulsively spending is definitely something I'm working on actively. And so I had to replace that behavior with something else. And I did that with baking. So stay home, <laughs> stayed in my kitchen, which I love my kitchen. And I baked 
and I baked four batches of banana nut muffins. <laughs> it's kind of, I went on another nerd tangent. I, ba I baked four batches of banana nut muffins, each with a different flour and a different sugar. <laughs> and uh, it was a really fun recipe. I love the book. It's called Desserts for Two and Comfort and Joy. If you, I, I can link these up so you can find them on Amazon. Uh, they're terrific small batch recipe books and they're designed like the, my cupcake recipe that I, I use for James's birthday makes four cupcakes. That's it. Not 10, not 12, not 20, four. And that is perfect for us, you know, family of three. I don't need 12 cu cupcakes sitting around. I don't want 12 cupcakes sitting around. Uh, and this recipe, I think this one, the banana nut muffin recipe came from Comfort and Joy. It makes 12 mini muffins, just 12, not 50 million, just 12. I love that. And it was small enough where, you know, I had four ripe bananas. I could take the bananas and, and test a different set of flowers and sugars with each banana. I love that. Uh, and I, you know, it's, it's been kind of a tangent. I've been, I've been going on, I'm learning more about cooking gluten-free and sugar-free. And sugar-free meaning uh, using a sugar alternative such as Swerve, or I've been playing with monk fruit sweetener and coconut sugar, which is not really a sugar substitute, but um, you know, just testing them out and seeing what works, seeing what messes up my stomach, seeing what goes really weird after one or two days. Monk fruit sweetener, just saying, goes really weird. It crystallizes in this freaky way. Um, it kind of goes powdery and white uh, in a dessert. So like, you know, if I, I made like a mini cheesecake with monk fruit sweetener and it went crystally powdery white. It was gross. It was really gross. So if you're going to use monk fruit sweetener, use it and eat it that day. Don't wait. Although, I mean, it had, it was, it was really good the day it came out of the oven, but just don't let it set around. Uh, I don't know why it does that. It was something about the chemical in the monk fruit sweetener crystallizes somehow and goes strange. Anyway, uh, James keeps telling me, I don't like this gluten-free stuff, mom. <laughs> What's hilarious is I had one batch, one bin of, uh, of muffins that I used. Half of them were done with regular flour, which James is a fan of regular flour. And I think one was regular flour, regular sugar, and the other one was uh, like a gluten-free blend from the grocery store and Swerve Sweetener. And James was like, I like those. I don't like any of that gluten-free stuff. It's like, you know, half of those banana nut muffins were gluten-free, right? And he didn't necessarily like that. So it was interesting. That's the thing. It's like, instead of dwelling on being sad, instead of dwelling on, oh my gosh, I feel like I'm about to cry. I short-circuited that and did something creative and different and made four batches of banana nut muffins and learned something new and just kind of, you know, worked through it. And baking is not for everybody. I find baking very, very relaxing. It, it brings me joy, you know? It, it, I don't know, there's just something very chill about it. I'm not working, but I'm not feeling like I'm being a lazy slug playing video games. I'm producing something, I'm making something that we can eat and enjoy. So baking for me is very relaxing. And uh, doing that test was really, I found it fascinating. I found it really interesting. Um, one thing that I thought was super cool about it, uh, clearly the type of flour, like wheat flour, has leavening properties. Because all of the times that I used the gluten-free flours, the muffins did not rise as high, even though I used the exact same leavening in all of them. Um, I think it was like baking powder or baking soda. Um, the gluten-free flours did not puff up as much. So that was interesting. I did not realize that, you know, the type of flour you're using will affect how puffy it gets. So that makes me think, okay, gluten-free, you might need to use just a little bit more leavening to balance that out and make up for it. I don't know. That, that's another day of testing. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I think, I think short-circuiting any emotion, you know, that could be perceived as a negative emotion, but I don't think it's necessarily negative. We all have times when we get sad. We all have times when we get mad. And I think that anger is not something that we should try and, you know, um, squash either. 
Uh, I have had many times in my life where I felt like I wasn't allowed to get angry about something. And I'm very careful about that now too. When I, and in, typically I find, you know, it kind of goes either way. If I am feeling kind of depressed, I can go angry <laughs> just as easily as I can go sad. It's just, it's that bottled up kind of thing coming out. And I'm watching out for both of those. And um, I think that you just need to find something creative to do that's different. And maybe away from the normal things and the normal routines of what you're doing. So as soon as the sun came out yesterday, I got outside uh, and it had been raining so continually. The ground was just solid, solid sponge. But I got out there and James and I put in another post for the rabbit hutch. And then Josh came out and we put in the last post for the rabbit hutch. And there's no question that the cement is going to hold because it was going basically into a watery hole. <laughs> so it's going to be fine. And yeah, it was great. That was also, you know, working on this rabbit hutch is doing something very different that I, you know, out of my comfort zone, not what I normally do. You know, it is construction, it's physical work, um, it's kicking my butt in a way that's making me realize I really need to exercise more and get off the computer a lot more and get outside a lot more. So it's, it's really good in, for all of those reasons. And, um, and I think particularly having rabbits and raising rabbits will be great. Uh, just continue to expand my backyard. Uh, and I love building buildings. I think it's so much fun. So yeah, planning all of that out and working, getting the sunshine, being physical, it totally knocked all of this out. So today woke up a little sore from hauling bags of concrete and moving posts and drilling and, you know, all of that nine yards, um, digging out the holes and stuff for the posts, but I feel great. I no longer feel that um, oppressive weight. Uh, I no longer feel just an absolute hatred of being in the basement and, you know, wanted to come down and get to going on the Scottish quilt, get these last few pieces glued on. And it was, it just took that, you know, kind of stepping away, taking a break, doing something totally different, doing something creative all of that dramatically helped my mood and it dramatically helped what was going on in my head. And I feel like a million bucks today. I really, really do. So I say if you're struggling with this, if you're struggling with the winter blues um, and you've got a project that's just bogging you down, maybe take a break on it. Maybe plow through it. There's two sides of it. I mean, sometimes, and I already know that when I get all of the, you know, this big project with the Friendship Quilt Along done, I, it's going to be a huge relief to have all of that off my back and know that it's in the bag and, you know, might even be starting the next quilt along, writing it and stuff for next year. These things take a lot of time, guys. They really, really, really do. Um, so it, that'll be a massive relief. And I think celebrating that relief is a really good thing. So if you've got a project that's just bogging you down, that's causing you a lot of problems, maybe sit down and say, I'm going to just blaze through it. You know, I'm going to spend the entire day on it and see how far I can go. And then surprise yourself with how, how far you can get with it. And that's, you know, sometimes you can kind of trick the system a little bit by having very low expectations, <laughs> which is great. Sometimes it'd be like, oh man, I'm only going to get one video done and I'll go out to the crafty cottage and I'm just on a roll and I'll shoot six or seven videos instead. And that feels amazing because then I come inside, I'm like, I'm done, I'm done, I got it all done, you know, and I'm celebrating because I set my expectations low, totally knocked it out of the ballpark and then it's time to celebrate. So I think that's really good too. I think working with bright colors is a good idea in general. Uh, you know, Mally shirt, I just had a lot of this orange. I had, it's a really, really bright orange batik. I think I cut out three or four of them in that color of fabric. It was just whatever I had upstairs. But I do think that the color of fabrics that you're working with can play a role in that. And, you know, working on this goddess quilt, I didn't really want to work on this goddess quilt over the weekend. Um, because it's very dark colors. It's dark blue and dark purple and uh, the teal is light, but it just didn't feel like the right thing for me to be working on at the time. So 
I think the colors that we're working on can also play a role where we're working on something. And it might, might be a little bit challenging. It might throw the house out of whack. But sometimes I need to pick up my ironing board and take it upstairs and work off my dining room table. The best light in my house is upstairs on my dining room table. It's where I love to write, um, I write my books. I, I usually either sit at the dining room table or I stand at the bar in my kitchen and it's got the best light in the house and that's why I like to work there. I like to work where it's light and bright and there feels like there's a lot of space around me. So keeping all of that in mind and really think about the places in your house that you love the best and to try and bring that into other places. You know, I have wanted to fix the basement so it doesn't have such low ceilings for years. I don't think that's ever gonna happen because it's just the way the house is built. But uh, I'm already looking at building another shed out in the backyard with uh, a tree house on top for James. And I'm kind of thinking through the possibilities here and thinking, well, what if I put a screened in porch on the tree house? <laughs> I mean, like crazy stuff, but you know, we only have one house and you know, if you're gonna build something awesome, you might as well go all out and, and really uh, make it something that not just your kids would wanna hang out in. You know, at some point James will grow out of the treehouse and not wanna hang out there anymore, but I can play there. You know, I can enjoy that screened in porch, certainly. So thinking about in things in those terms, I think is really good. And I'm also one of those types of people that if it is not the way I like it, I think it is an absolute imperative to go change it to be the way I like it. I am not afraid of picking up a drill. I am not afraid of picking up a level or a hammer and tearing it up and putting it back the way I want it. And it's something I'm very proud of. And it's something I really hope that more women will do as well. Because, you know, if, if you don't like the way something is going and no one else seems bothered by it, well, the only person that can make that change is you, right? So there we go. I have finished up my goddess. She is all glued together and all she needs now is to be secured to the background. But I think I'm going to do the hand applique as a smaller unit. So I'm gonna leave her in this smaller shape, finish up all the hand applique, and then I'll stitch it to the background at the very end. So that's it for the podcast this week. You can find many more podcast episodes at leahday.com slash podcast. And if you'd like to support the show and all of the free tutorials that I share online every week, come and check out the Quilt Friends Club. This is a membership place for my best quilting friends where you can post photos, you can ask questions, you can make friends from quilters around the world and it's just $2.99 a month or $24.99 a year. So come and check that out at quiltfriends.club. Until next time, let's go quilt. <laughs>